When most of us think of the world, we tend to think of it in terms of what we learned at school. We think of one planet spinning along in the vast emptiness of space, subject to the gravitational forces of a star that sits at some random point in some kind of system called a galaxy. Even the galaxy is part of a bigger system. But the way in which we conceptualize the world is generally based on the imagery that we've been surrounded with since childhood, depicting the discoveries associated with humanity's push into deep space. This concept of world is often distinctly separated for us from everyday human experience, which is scientifically classified as simply being a part of the organic life that emerged on this planet, life that can't be proven to have emerged by any force greater than random chance. The human race is just a drop in a river of progress that flows on and on in constant change, a river that renders everything relative and meaningless. There are variations in the specifics of how we think like this, but at some level, this is what we have all been convinced must be true, because we saw it mapped out for us at school, or by close mentors, or maybe we delved into the topic out of curiosity ourselves. This way of thinking is a part of what one might consider the tradition of the West. It can be traced back to the Greeks in terms of historical sources, but there is something about it that sits at the very heart of the psychology of man, and is much older than the Greeks. With the age of enlightenment, the principles of the Greeks won a status in the eyes of Western thinkers, which made them the emissaries of absolute truth, as opposed to the regressive and waning powers of the medieval church. Through the church, humanity had won a kind of dignity, an unquestionable place in the world, as the divinely ordained rulers of reality, the masters of creation, shapers of the earth. After the church's long schismatic collapse, culminating in the Thirty Years' War, this human-centered way of understanding the world only intensified, leading to a way of thinking called absolutism. Now kings were, as in ancient times, gods on earth, and heaven was thought to have been reached with the towers men had built for themselves. Desperate for orientation and control over a world that seemed to be teetering on the brink of an altogether absolute kind of collapse, the alchemists and philosophers of the old world climbed to the top of these towers and looked to the stars like the Magi once had in an attempt to bring the world back into order. And, with the help of the Greek writings, thinkers like Nicholas Copernicus, Kepler and Newton distilled the tools that would be used by others to emancipate the world from the cruel hands of humanity. It could finally be seen for that which it was, an inanimate rock among many others, floating without any significance into the void. Man was nothing more than a mold riding on its back, making the most of the sunlight it could catch. Or so they thought. Through this process, anthropology was reduced to something that man could measure with his eyes. It was nothing more than a diagram on a wall, and some words explaining it in a book. The question of what man was could be answered by looking at the cells of which he was constituted, and human nature was reduced to a higher form of ape life. Never once was it considered what humanity was aping. Anything that was higher than man was just a projection that man imagined into the inanimate rock surrounding him, so that he felt less alone in the void, and could legitimize his cruelty towards his fellow man, and his abuse of the woman, and his neglect of the child. What was invisible, as the Greeks had taught us once Plato had been waved off as too speculative, was of no consequence. With our eyes, we would know all. There is only one flaw in this way of seeing the world. The Greeks were not the only thinkers of their age, and the reactionaries that turned to their writings in response to the medieval church were just as quick to turn to the very thing they had accused the Pope of abusing. Power. Power for its own sake. The power of the world lies in the knowledge of its laws. Thus a new caste of priest was established. The scientist. A prophet for the natural law. A mediator between knowledge and man. There is an irony in the fact that man looked at his brother, judged him an animal, and thought that he had understood the world by doing so. 
In doing this, he was completely unaware of the fact that something enabled him to judge in the first place, and that he could be judged just as easily and with just as great a lack of competence or authority. The fact is that man cannot understand himself. He is bound to his nature, which came from origins that he did not decide, and which he cannot teach himself, even if he looks out into the void that he cannot recognize for what it truly is. The more aggressively he stares out at other things and people, propelled by the need to dominate them, in the name of whatever spirit has possessed him, be it a spirit of absolute climate, absolute indulgence, absolute minimalism, or absolutely not, the less he is aware of what he is doing, and of what he is. He becomes what he worships, a mouth for the voice in his ear, and is untethered from the reality in which he lives for the sake of living in a world that isn't real. If everyone claims to be telling you the one truth that can save you from dying, and everyone is saying something else, everyone must be lying. That is the logic of our age. There is no salvation. There is only a sea of lies, and we are cruelly thrown into it to sail its waters on the frail boat of our decomposing bodies, until we become like the void that we have spent too long staring into. A bleak world without meaning, in which all structure and order is only an attempt to seize power for its own sake. If this is true, there is nothing that justifies human existence nor even the existence of anything. If this is true, then entropy is God, and there is only decay. But decay needs something to feed on. Two thousand years ago, a body lay in a tomb. It was the body of a man, which decay couldn't consume. It was the body of a man that had emerged from an ancient people, from the line of prophets, priests, and kings. His corpse lay there as the result of the fact that he had claimed for himself a deity which had spoken by the prophets. He had said that their words testified to him. He had walked the wildernesses and wastelands of Palestine, teaching these scriptures to those that would listen. After three days, this man's body was no longer in the tomb, but stood remade before those same followers he had taught before his death. Again he showed them how the Hebrew scriptures spoke of him, and these followers recorded later that all worlds were made through him, so that the logic of all things reflects his character. They became a new caste of priests, those that proclaimed truth not as an abstract set of laws, but as a man on whom the decay of all things had failed to catch a hold because he was also the source of the one thing that until today defies entropy. Life. This is the anthropology of the Bible. God made man in his image. Man, as Christ taught, is not only a higher form of ape, as he apes God, but is primarily a temple, a dwelling place, a house. This is bedded in the very language of scripture as the Hebrew language describes all of reality as reflecting man, and in so doing, reflecting the one in whose image man was made. This doesn't mean that scripture anthropomorphizes creation, much rather it recognizes that man is a part of creation, and is shaped according to the same laws as all of the things that have been entrusted into his care. The pattern that is established through this use of language is that of a fractal world, a world in which a divine order radiates outward and beautiful symmetry from a central dwelling place, shaping what was formless before to harmonize with it. As a result, wellsprings are called eyes in Hebrew, just as eyes are wells of water in the face of a man. Holes in the earth are referred to as mouths, as are the edges of swords and the openings to sacks, as these are the mouths that devour sacrifices, consuming the life that is offered up to them or greedily devoured by them. This isn't a world opposed to scientific observation. It is simply the world scientifically observed by men who are aware that they cannot determine reality, but that they are much more an inextricably and important part of its design, that they are houses intended for the breath of life. Hello, and welcome to the Philippocrit 
uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, it's a bit different to the, the things that I've made in the in the past, but I thought it might be nice to do a bit of a, a series on the anthropology of the Bible, and this is the introduction to that. So uh, stay tuned, and in the next couple of months, <laughs> weeks probably, um, I'll probably be working out the next episode, which will go more into depth about how um, man is the temple of the breath of life, or the Holy Spirit, <laughs> um, after Christ. So Christ will obviously always play a central role in establishing the bridge between heaven and earth uh, for humanity, because Adam severed it. So, so there's a bit of a, a spoiler for what's coming, a teaser. <laughs> Uh, in the next video but yeah I, I hope you like that let me know what you think because this is a bit different to the things that i've usually done i am still working on genesis um, to get into the hebrew text there again and i'm also still working on jeremiah so so there are a couple of other projects that you can also keep an eye out for also on lambda bible studies so until we see each other again i hope you have a good time stay safe god bless maranatha